Hi, my name is Sandra Batekis and I'd like to welcome you to Windows Vista Level 2 for Intermediate Users. This is going to be a great class, a fun class, and I will tell you, having taught all the different versions of Windows for many, many years since Windows was introduced, this will be by far my favorite operating system to play with. It has a lot of different tools and tricks, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Again, as a Microsoft Certified Instructor and Systems Engineer and an end user, I will tell you that you'll find everything in this course a whole lot easier than it has been in previous versions. In this module, we'll talk about how to set up your PC. Some of the things that are involved in setting up your PC is transferring files and settings. We've all had old PCs and we've all had to migrate to a new PC and we all know that that's a really long, painful process. Well, it's not a long process anymore because it's a great little wizard that will allow us to transfer anything it is that we need. Above and beyond that, we will talk about the new computer, how to specify which one's going to be the new computer, and how to customize that new computer in a variety of fashions. Now, one of the fashions that we'll get to talk about is something called program defaults. And this will allow you to decide what your default email program will be, what your default web browser will be, and quite a few other choices. But again, so this way, your PC works the way you want it to, not the way it wants to. Now, beyond default programs, we'll have other customized settings and file types and protocols and how we want to handle all of those. And we'll also learn how to turn various components on and off. Now, these components might have a lot to do with documents and running programs, but they may also be various accessories within Windows itself that maybe you don't feel you need or you wish you had and it hadn't been installed for you off the bat. Now, PCs these days are no longer standalone. Everyone seems to connect to something. So we will talk about dial-up and internet access and how to make connections outside of the PC itself. Now, once you start creating different connections, of course, you might want to see which one is your default connection, which is going to be the first one you'll use if you're trying to go out onto the web. And that brings me to the next point. When you go out onto the internet, one of the first things we're all looking for is for our email. So we do have Windows Mail. It comes with the operating system. There are a lot of mail programs out there, and this one works just fine. We will spend some time talking about Windows Mail and give you some light instructions on how to set it up according to your ISP's directions. Now, beyond mail, of course, you might want to print those messages, so that will bring us into printing, whether that printer be a local printer or whether it be a network printer. Last but not least, we will talk about hardware, how to set up new hardware on the machine itself. And luckily with Vista, a lot of it is easy enough where you plug it in and you turn it on. But if that doesn't work, obviously we have some other steps we'll want to try behind the scenes. Now, if you already have an existing PC and you'd like to transfer all your files and settings to the new PC, then there is a great wizard that will allow you to do this, and it's your easy transfer wizard put out by Windows. Now, you'll see in this course there's a lot of ways to get into everything, and I guess that's the way Windows has always been. However, what you'll see is most of the time, the first two bullets I'll talk about is how to use the start menu and then how to, what the name of the actual program is so you can use your menus. Now, the first method, of course, is you click on start, and right above start is a little search bar, and in that search bar, you can just type the word easy. Now, what happens in that search bar is it does an automatic search of anything that you type in it. So as you're typing these little shortcuts, what you see at the top of the screen is going to be the name of the program. Now, this happens to be the shortcut that allow you to execute the program as well. So if you type in the word easy and you press enter, it'll actually start the Windows Easy Transfer Wizard. Now again, you could click at the top of the start menu after you type in this word because you'll see that it finds it. Or you can navigate through your programs menu and you'll be able to find it there as well. Now I'll try not to spend this much time every single slide because we'll be doing this quite a bit. But do realize that's the method and I'll always give you those two methods wherever appropriate. Now, what this Easy Wizard has is device support, and the device support is for a CD or a USB drive or a network path. So as you're transferring your files and settings from your old computer to your new computer, these are the three methods or the three locations you've got to actually put the data. Now, some of the items that it'll transfer for you is the user accounts, all the folders and files that belong to these user accounts, your program settings, your internet settings, your favorites, we all know the internet favorites are the most important, 
and of course your email settings, your contacts, and all of your messages. Now with all of these you can customize what you want to take with you and what you want to leave behind, but these are really the most common options that people tend to use. Now what happens is on your new computer, the new Vista computer that you've just purchased or just built and you're ready to bring everything over, you actually run this wizard and you specify that this is a new computer. You can also specify which device to use and which transfer method you're going to use. Because if you have an older computer, it obviously doesn't have the Vista Easy Transfer Wizard. So what you're able to do is essentially build a disk and run the wizard from this disk over on the old machine to help you kick off this transfer. Now on the old computer itself, when this wizard has uh, specified transfer, you say this is the old computer. We specify which device we're getting our settings from, what our transfer method is going to be, and of course we start the wizard. And from there it really becomes quite, quite easy because it allows us to essentially uh, walk through the I want my documents, I want my files, I want all the user accounts, and it's really going to ask you every step of the way how much information you need to transfer. Now in terms of program defaults, what you can do in order to initiate this is you go to start, you click in the little search area and you type in DEFA, the beginning of the word default. And what you can choose out of here, amongst many other things, is select default programs. Now the reason we would go in here is because in this land of software we have multiple browser choices, multiple email choices, word processing, you name it. We have a lot of programs that all do the same thing. So let's say your machine has Netscape, Internet Explorer, Firefox, or anything else that you found. You may want to specify which one of those is your default program so that when you double click on an HTM file or anything that would normally open within a browser, that it picks the browser that you would have picked first. So that's really what we're trying to do here in program defaults. Now some of the other items we can do is we can associate files with programs. <coughs> Let's say you're running Microsoft Office 2003 and Microsoft Office 2007. You might want to specify which one of those versions you want to open by default every time you double click on a file. We've got autoplay defaults, so when you put a CD-ROM in, if it has an autoplay, do you want that to kick off or do you want to choose to run that at your convenience? And of course, we can specify all of our program access and computer defaults as well. Now again, some of the items that you choose from for default programs, and probably the most common choices, is web browsing, videos, that's a big one. We have iTunes, we have the Windows Media Player, and we have about 10,000 others that people have loaded on their machine. And of course, email. You have Outlook, you have Outlook Express, you have Microsoft Mail, and again, a whole bunch of other programs that some people choose to use. Now, when you move into customizing settings, you get to pick which file types and which protocols we want used by each program. Now, let's talk about protocols a little bit, because that might be a term that you're not used to working within. An example of a protocol that you might use at this level is HTTP or FTP. Now, those probably sound familiar, whether or not you know what you're typing in the address bar. Your HTTP is your hypertext transfer protocol, which in English means web pages. That's how you transfer web pages from an internet server down to your local machine. So again, that might be a protocol. Whenever you access something via HTTP, you want to open up this program. FTP is a download protocol that allows you to download large files and documents and whatever else you're downloading, even music. So again, anytime you execute FTP, which program do you want that to happen in? Internet Explorer can handle FTP, Windows Explorer can handle FTP, or you may have already installed your favorite FTP program. When you turn components on and off, what it allows us to do is to essentially customize what's going on in the machine. Now one of the most important steps, or the first steps we want to do, is we want to save all of our documents, anything we're working on, close all the running programs, and if there are other users logged on to the machine and you're just switching users, you should really log them off as well. Because what happens is if files are in use, it's a lot harder to turn them on and off or components within. So how we go ahead and do this is we go to Start, Control Panel, Programs, and within Programs you'll see there's a uh, link for Turn Features On and Off. 
And what you can do is you can collapse and expand each one of these components with a plus and the minus in order to see which ones you're going to change. And then you just click right there in the checkbox. Let's take a moment to talk about internet access. Now, most of the machines, a very vast majority of the machines out there these days do in fact connect to the internet. Now, how they connect to the internet can be entirely different. It depends on the organization you work for or what you have set up in your current house. Now, you may magically have a wireless connection that if you connect, you're allowed out. You may know when you flip on your machine, you're always out because when the guy from the cable place came, that's what he did for you and it works. So again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. And in the back end, there's a lot of ways to get it to accomplish. Now, if you're sitting at a machine and it's not instantaneous in terms of you getting out onto the internet and that has not been set up for you, an example, a high-speed DSL or cable modem type connection, then you may have to specify this one yourself. Now, when you use dial-up, you just create a dial-up connection and you connect to the internet service provider that you're currently paying for this service. And again, there's only going to be so far I can take you in this because a lot of the settings that I'd like to give you really going to come from the service provider that you've signed up for. It could be America Online, it could be a Verizon, it could be a Comcast. There are countless of them out there. So again, they're, they're going to be where you get some of the actual details of this connection. But let's start at the generic piece and that is just the Connect To dialog. So when you go to the Start menu, you'll see Connect To right there waiting for you. And you're going to specify, in this case, a dial-up connection because you want to dial up to the internet, or maybe you want to dial into your local workplace because they have this option for you. Now, what you'll have to do beyond that is to enter in a lot of connection information that you receive from the internet service provider. This might be various security settings, protocol settings. Of course, it will also include a phone number because you're essentially using the modem and your phone line to connect to them. So you'll take these settings, and as you go through the wizard, go ahead and answer the questions according to the information that you have. There's something else that we can talk about called dialing rules. And what a dialing rule is, is it allows you to essentially put in little variables like an access code that you need to get out. We know in a lot of organizations, you dial 9 to get out, so that might be an example. It might be whether or not to do the area code and a few other items that you can actually populate some of those fields with. So the dialing rules are for you to customize not necessarily the ISP's information, but certain things that you know about your phone system, your network, and your computer. When you're all done with this wizard, all you have to do is save the connection, and you'll have a chance to give it a name. So this name is something that you choose. It just might be Internet Dial-Up, or if you're dialing into a company, I would pick maybe the name of the company, but something that will allow you to remember what that connection really means. It's entirely possible to have more than one dial-up connection. I know as a consultant, I dial into Connect2. I use various methods to get to all my different customers. So if you were to look at all my connections, there's probably 50 or 60 of them. And it's important because I get to pick which one's my default and really how to manage them as a group. This is why the naming convention is a lot more important than you may think. Now, once you have your connection or your connections, maybe you have to set up two or three because you're dialing into various offices, what you want to do is you want to set up some connection defaults. Now, if you go into Control Panel, you'll see something called Network and Internet. And within Network and Internet, there is something, again, called Internet Options. You can also get this screen from opening up Internet Explorer itself and going down to Tools and choosing Options. So there's two good ways into this one dialog box. There is a tab. It's called Connections. And on the Connections tab, you get to specify a lot of different items about which one's going to be your default connection, whether or not you're going to use a proxy server. There's a lot of local area network items in there as well. What I want to show you in this example is how to establish which one is going to be your default connection. That's important because if you're going to use this for your internet, then you want to be able to open up Internet Explorer and have it automatically dial out for you. And again, select which connection you want by default and some of the items down at the bottom. Always dial a connection, never dial a connection. We'll go through some of these in a, in a demonstration very shortly. Now, in terms of Windows Mail, this is a program that comes with Vista. It's very similar to Outlook and Outlook Express or any of the other mail systems that you may have experience with. But in this case, they just call it 
mail. So if you want to start it by using the search bar, click on start, and then just type the word mail. Now again, you'll see the start menu pops up and Windows Mail will be up at the top of the list, but if you press enter, it'll select it for you, or you can navigate through your programs menu and find Windows Mail. Now in order to set up an email account, you need to contact a service provider. So this is an information that you can arbitrarily fill in right there on your machine. We're going to have to start this process with your settings from the service provider that's going to be sending you all the email. So some of the information you'll need from them is, of course, your name, how you want it to appear on email. You want your email address, what it's going to be, what type of incoming mail server. You'll get a choice of something called POP or IMAP. Now, POP is an oldie but goodie. It's a download-only mail. And the difference between POP and IMAP is POP will actually download all of your email from that internet-based server to the local hard drive. The good news is if you have space limits on that server, then you're never going to reach them because you're constantly pulling everything off of the server and essentially clearing it off. The disadvantage to POP is that if you have web-based mail, so if you're traveling you can hit a web page, you'll be able to see all the new messages but not the ones you've already downloaded because they'll be back at your machine. Now the newer version of that is something called IMAP. <coughs> With IMAP, you can actually keep a copy on the server and on the local drive. So if disk space isn't an issue up on that server, it's probably a better choice so that you can download messages and work offline if you need to. But if you're traveling, you're not near your desk, you could probably hit this provider's web page and check your mail that way as well. Now, I'd like to say you get to choose which one of these to configure, but realistically, this information comes from your internet service provider. Some of them, however, will give you a choice of POP or IMAP, so that's going to be a question for you to ask before coming into this wizard. Some of the other information we'll need is the address of an incoming and an outgoing mail server. Now, it's going to be in the form of basically uh, a web page without the www. Examples of this might be mail dot the name of your domain dot com. So let's say you use Verizon, it might be mail dot Verizon dot net, or Sometimes they'll use names like incoming.verizon.net or outgoing.verizon.net. Now, I only use Verizon because it's a company we've obviously all heard of, but again, you want to defer to whoever is providing you with this email. You'll need your account name and password as they are going to need it entered. And you also need to find out from this um, party if a secure password authentication is needed or if outgoing server security is going to be needed as well. With all of these questions, you can go into the Windows Mail Wizard and set yourself up an account and be able to send and receive email very quickly. Now, if you've already set it up and you're just accessing a new email account, because it is possible to have more than one, then all you need to do is go to the Tools menu within Windows Mail and then choose Accounts from the bottom of that menu. In terms of setting up a printer, this is going to vary depending on if the printer is connected to your local machine or whether it's a network printer, which means a printer connected to a different machine. Now, if it's on your local machine, you do need to be a local administrator of that machine. If it's a network, you don't necessarily have to be so. So one of the first steps we do is we go to Start, we go to Control Panel, and you'll see items like hardware, sound, and eventually printers. Now, within Printer, you can also click this in the search button, so click in search, type in printer, it'll find it. And we want to start this process by clicking on that first icon to the left, and it's called Add a Printer. Now, in order to add a printer, and again, it being a local printer, you'll need to be signed on as the local administrator or a user who has administrative capabilities. And some of the information that you'll need is which port it's connected to, the manufacturer make and model, the display name, and uh, we'll have a question on whether or not you want this to be the printer, the default printer for every time you hit print. And of course, it'll let you print a test page. Now, a few things I do like to say. The port itself is usually going to be LPT1. That seems to be a common printer port. However, we now have a lot of USB printers. They are just as popular, if not more print popular, so you'll want to know which one of these ports you're using. In terms of the manufacturer make and model, if you go through the wizard, you'll see you get a choice of manufacturer. When you click on it, all the models appear right next to it. 
If your model isn't in there, there is a little button called Have Disk. So you click on Have Disk and you go navigate out to where you saved the printer drivers or where the CD is that came with the printer in the first place. Now again, this is one of these lessons that's a little hard to learn because there's so many thousands of printers out there. Some of the printers will actually come with their own installation disk. What's going to be important is that you read the directions before you start setting up the printer because the case I'm presenting you with is a case that's going to work most of the time and it's definitely going to work with all the older printers. Some of the newer printers prefer you to run their setup program before you even plug the printer in. So again, you may want to consult that documentation. These are going to be your generic steps for all the other printers. To connect to a network printer, what you want to do is you want to use something called Add a Printer. It should sound familiar now. And this time, you're not going to pick Local Printer. You're going to pick Network Printer. Now, a network printer is a printer that is connected to someone else's machine and shared. So they've already had to install the local drivers on their machine as the administrator and share that printer, which again is something only the administrator would have been able to do. All you have to do is you hit Browse and you go browse for the printer until you find it. And you're going to find it by finding first the name of the machine that it's on. So you will want to know the name of the machine that the printer is attached to. Let's talk a little bit about setting up hardware. Now, the good news is with Vista, it's extremely easy. The vast majority of the time, you're going to plug that new piece of hardware in. Let's say it's a flash drive or a USB drive. You're going to turn it on if, if applicable, and it's going to find it, and it's going to install it, and you'll see a little bubble pop up that says found new hardware, and you're done. Now, I've just given you the best case scenario. Unfortunately, in this land, it's not always that easy. Most of the time it's that easy, but you will get some challenges here and there. Now there's a couple of things about setting up hardware. One of the first things I do need to tell you is you have to consult the documentation that comes with the hardware itself. Every manufacturer is going to determine how their piece of hardware is going to be installed. A good example is a lot of the newer USB printers. What happens is a manufacturer supplies you with a CD-ROM and they want you to run its setup program first before you even plug the piece of hardware in. One of the reasons for this is that is so it installs what the operating system needs in order to recognize it. Then you plug it in and plug and play works and you get the little bubble and we found your hardware and we're installing it and the whole process works great from there. So again, you want to take a look at the piece of hardware that you have, consult any documentation that comes with it, and if they advise you any differently, then you may want to take that path before you take this path. Now, your generic set of instructions for setting up hardware, and it will work most of the time if plug and play hasn't, is you plug the device in, turn it on, wait for Vista to recognize it. Sometimes it'll recognize the hardware, but it just doesn't know what kind of hardware. So maybe it's a network card or a video card, and you've installed it, whether physically in the computer or externally, and it will pop up and say, we found this new NVIDIA card, and essentially prompts you for the driver. Most of the time it will ask if it can go out to the internet and try to download a driver. It doesn't always work. So again, you want to have the device drivers local to the machine or on a CD-ROM so that you can browse, point to where they are, and you should be good. The good news is if you do have the drivers on disk, on the CD-ROM, on a removable disk saved to the hard drive, you can tell Vista to search the hard drive for the drivers for you. So if they're physically there somewhere, it has a pretty good chance of finding it. Now, if it's not recognized, again, click on the link to search the web, and you can usually go up to the manufacturer's website and download the appropriate driver. Now, I realize I've probably used the word driver a few times, and I probably haven't defined it well enough. For those of you who are newer to this term driver, all a driver is is a piece of software that tells the hardware how to work. So a device driver is essentially a set of instructions for that piece of hardware that also include all the items that piece of hardware is capable of, what it is, what version it is, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a little definition in the event that one is new to you. Now, in terms of setting up hardware manually, you don't turn on the device. You install the program provided by the manufacturer, just like I had mentioned earlier. So you put in the manufacturer's CD, you run the entire setup process, and then when the manufacturer prompts you, you can go ahead and turn on that device so the rest of the install can complete.